Hi, I'm John Atek, and I'm extremely pleased to have Karen de la Carrière here. This is the first time we've met before, which was great, but, but I've not interviewed you before, so I'm really thrilled to, to be seeing you. Thank uh, you, John. Thank you. We met in London, was it four years ago? I think it was about... We actually had lunch in that big conference table with a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, the amazing author of... What's the book? Russell... Russell, Russell Miller was with us. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I worked with Russell throughout Bareface Messiah as his researcher. And my, yeah. that's how these yeah. people, Blue, Blue Sky was the foundation upon yeah. which he looked because I couldn't find a publisher. So after he was published, yeah. I then managed to get into print. But yeah. um, he is one of the world's most celebrated biographers. His biography mm -hmm. of uh, Conan Doyle, for example, or, or Hugh Hefner or Getty or. So Ron Hubbard was one of the, the series. And it's a great oh, book. It still know. stands. Uh, I think. So a piece of blue sky has had a life of its own. <laughs> when, I, when I picked it up, I literally stayed up two o'clock. I mean, it's, it's a nice, easy read. But I could not put it down. It was riveting. Oh, thank you. I think we should... I'll be promoting this show to at least 22 Facebook groups, all of X, X, X. And I'm going to, uh, uh, let, is it available on Amazon? Yeah, it, we, we reissued it because when it was first published, we had to paraphrase 60 of Hubbard's most private statements, his harassment orders, his journals and his letters mm -hmm. because of a strange situation in American law. In 2018, we brought out the unexpurgated version, which has all 60 of those quotations back in about oh. more for good. Oh. But mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's called Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky now. There is still a pirate edition that's called A Piece of Blue Sky, but that's the original mm -hmm. book. And I want nothing to do with the people who are trying to steal it from me. Yeah, I heard you didn't get any royalties. I got you some. I got oh, some. I got some. But it went bestseller. It went number 98 out of 4 million books at Amazon. And I didn't get anything from that period. Jeez. Jeez. And well, you were the godfather. There have been books and books and books, but you stuck your neck out in the early days, right? It, it, that was very brave of you. Oh, thank very you. Very brave. It, this, that means this week I've been called the original gangster on Leah yeah. Remini's show and The Godfather. Yeah. What does this tell us? <laughs> yeah. But, you but were brave, John. You were I, brave. I, it, I never really thought about it. Some, some, I think Leah asked me in the podcast they've just put up on Fair Game um, why I did it. And in the end, I just had to say, oh, I'm pig-headed. <laughs> That's it. You know, I, I, yeah. and it took me ages after I left because I was nine years in. I did OT5 as a class two auditor, did the data series evaluators course, Dynetic yes. Auditor, Method One Auditor, all that stuff. Totally believed in it, absolutely, through that time, never on staff. And when I left, it was like, well, this is wrong and they've done the wrong things. And of course, somebody has to stand up and say this. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what the Guardian's office were going to do in response. And I couldn't understand why all of these people I was talking to were so scared. These people who'd done these OT levels and you know mm -hmm. been at high, been commanding officers of various organisations, and they were oh no, not going to say anything. And mm -hmm. I did, I just didn't understand it. And mm -hmm. at first, I thought, well, it's because they know what the Guardian's office will do, and you'll be harassed. But then I came to something else, and it, this was quite some time afterwards. I heard this this expression total convert and I realized that because I was never on staff I was never abused or humiliated and I also realized that of the thousand or so Scientologists I've talked to I can't think of anyone else that's true for everybody else I know was crush regged into you know selling something they didn't have borrowing money or, or they were treated as a slave in the sea organization or you know um when I came to uh, I helped to uh, put together the Leite case in 1984, the famous child custody case in England. And I, I happened to know Jay Hurwitz. And so I said to the, the couple who were doing it, oh, Jay will come and testify because he had been the business partner 
of the father of the children, David Banks, who I think I can name now without anything happening too badly. And David Banks, and I don't think this has ever been publicly said, he'd said in sworn statements to the court that um, he thought disconnection was a dreadful thing. You know, he didn't agree with this. And Jay came along and gave me a letter that David Banks had written saying that they could put a partition up the staircase and through the office so they'd never have to actually see each other. This is how much he didn't believe in disconnection. But when I told the stepfather of the kids, Jay Hurwitz will come along, he blanched. He was scared. And I sort of, what, what's going on? He said, I, I worked for Jay. And the last time I saw him, he pushed me up against the wall and threatened to punch me, you know. And those kind of pressures, this, these, this never happened to me. So I was foolish enough to be able to speak out against it. And after that, it was, I think Jeffrey has the same thing that I have. You've just got to know the answer. You've started asking these questions. What was Hubbard really doing? What was this all about? You know, and, and I went on to 96, then I left. Then I came back in 2013 and started writing for Tony Ortega's Bunker because I realized that most people don't really escape, that the way of thinking is so overwhelming that even though they've got rid of, you know, they're not talking about the overt motivator sequence anymore. Now they're talking about karma. And if they've read anything about it, they're talking about karma vipaka, but we won't get into that. But they're still thinking. This is still the, the way the universe is. And of course it isn't. Elrond Hubbard's perception of the universe was the perception of a narcissist, you know, and it was all about him trying to desperately cure all of these things that were wrong with him, which he lists in great detail in Dianetics and Modern Science and Mental Health, asthma, short-sightedness, bursitis. I'd never heard of bursitis before, but he had it in the right shoulder. You know, there's a bursa there between the muscle and the bone and it wasn't working properly and it never did. And of course he never stopped being short-sighted. He never overcame his asthma. But I think he was also trying to deal with his own desperate psychiatric condition. Yeah. And yeah. we just got, you know, we became part of that solipsistic mess that was the ego of L. Ron Hubbard. But I, I'm not here to... to no, no, I love it. I love when you're on a roll. I prefer interviews that go like this and it, no. it gets an energy going. Hmm. I will... I want to say two things. Yeah. One is there are people like you <laughs> in Scientology slang, if I, a kick ass Satan. Kick ass means you kick ass or arse, as they say in England. <laughs> That's sound right when you but say that. It does it. But why do you do that? I'll tell you why. What is really important, I'm being evaluative. I can evaluate. And now, yeah. Loud. You pursue truth and you like to uncover lies. I'm dialed into you and I really read you what is important to you, what is a wanted within your soul is to just disintegrate fake falsehoods. And that's probably why the book I want to sell you a piece of blue sky came forth because you saw lies. And I think it's so important in your heart to reveal truth. Am I? <laughs> Not <Thank> only <laughs> truth, actual <laughs> knowledge, wisdom, fact. Did I read you well there? I, 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 gotta, I gotta tell you, somebody posted your SB declare on Outer Banks, was it Outer Banks or Exander? And it was a hoot to read. Not only in those days, they were more daring with their SVD as a person, but they said, if you connect with John, if you are friendly with him, you too will get, do you know they put that in your SV declare that just connect? Well, you must have seen it, right? It's been a while. It's been a <laughs> what a hoot. It was just laughable. They don't now, they don't even send you your SP to come back. Oh no. It's I, I, hidden in HCO and under lock and key. Mm, yeah. So you, you're 
an uncoverer of lives. What I, I really dialed into you, John, you, if you get an opportunity, that's why you interview people like me. You want to continue to unpeel and undress and unveil the packages of lies. And there are a lot of lies inside of it. A lot of lies. May I respond to you on one nice issue you brought up, which is why people cling on and are so indoctrinated? I want to give you, uh, I, want to, I want to toss it, actually, I want your response to my response. Of course, yeah. It has been said that people will suffer a humongous amount of pain for a little piece of pleasure. And what I want to tell you is in very early Scientology, you can get a win. A win. It's not sustainable, doesn't last, you can crash and burn next week. <clears throat> but in that little win, people get hooked and they want to replicate that win. So if they go into debt for $100,000 to have three L's, whose results are temporary, not sustainable, and they crash and burn and they divorce their wife six months later and they go bankrupt, blah, 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 blah. but they want, they're hooked up on the win. They want that few moments of win. Can you say something? <laughs> Can you respond to that? Absolutely. You're quite, you're absolutely right. <coughs> but it, it's what Abram Maslow, the psychologist, called a peak experience. And you, if you talk, I've uh -huh. talked with people who, for example, took LSD. Yeah. I mean, that was a popular thing to do. Yeah. And they had a peak experience and they wanted to repeat that. They wanted yes. to do that. Again. Yes. Worse yet, if they took cocaine. <laughs> They, they can become yeah. addicted to it. And I started quite soon after I left looking at Scientology as, as a process of addiction. That you have, a, you know, a, um, yeah. Yeah. very good indicators, VGIs, this idea yeah. of euphoria that, that you become. Yes. Euphoric, you feel yes. Fantastic. Well, that feeling, as you say, you want to repeat that. You want to get to it again. What I found the, when I was when I first left, almost everybody I talked to, and I talked to hundreds of people, I'd say, "What was the first win? What was the first peak experience? When did you have it?" It'd usually be on training routines, very often on training routines. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. I knew about that because I was I'd done I'd studied Zen meditation before Scientology, so I know if you fix your attention, you get what's called mm -hmm. the Gansfeld effect. You will start mm -hmm. to, you know, to have distortions of perception and then your brain will start to fill in hallucinations. You'll start to see things, but you'll also start getting a feeling of euphoria. So I knew mm -hmm. all about that. I'd been doing, you know, before I got to Scientology. Yeah. The other place where people would very often have a win would be in a book one session or in an mm -hmm. early auditing session. Mm -hmm. And the same was true for me. For me, it was a self-analysis session I had where you just feel fantastic. And you think that that feeling fantastic belongs to the process or procedure, whereas in fact, it belongs to you. It, yeah. It's your thing. <laughs> and right it, on. You're hooked, you know. It's a, you can go to a casino and you can win half a million dollars one night. And boy, the casino laughs at you because you'll be back and yeah, every right. dollar of that half a million will be given back because the euphoria you feel on the win of getting half a million dollars for no work at all. You just want to repeat that. You believe you are invincible enough to recreate that. So you give it right back. So there's this involuntary replication when you were saying how people just keep believing, even when their family is destroyed, that disconnected, they're broke because they've given every last dime, taken out a second mortgage on their home, and they still want to be loyal to Hubbard. Mm -hmm. 
it's this euphoria that they cannot forget. And they believe that continuing no matter what hardship will replicate that euphoric happiness. They yearn for it. And I know that because the arguments I get when people, I'm friendly with a lot of people who are still half in, half out. And, you know, they debate me and they, they reprimand me for my video channel and think it's not fair that I say bad things about Harvard and that, 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 that we get into discussion. No matter what hardship, no matter what penalty, I was talking to an OTA who has incredible body, body problems. Just his body is falling apart. And I said to him, but Dianetics says you won't even get a common cold after Dianetics. And look at you, OT8, you've given them a million dollars. You're, I'm in better health than you. I run three miles a day at my age. And you doing auditing your BTs and your entities every day, every day, every day. Look at you. <laughs> can't, can't, can't get him to see, can't get him to see. He fervently believes. And that's because he says, Karen, haven't you had wings? He keeps harping on the fact that you have that peak that you talked about. So to try and understand the mind of a dedicated liar Scientologist is, although people do reach a threshold, don't you agree? And then they depart. Everybody will take that much. But yeah, and, it, and it's a matter of peeling the onion and taking the layers off until they get there. I mean, with most of us, the process was that the organization was too harsh. That was where it starts for most people, that the organization is just nasty. When I, in 1982, saw the name David Miscavige for the first time, it was in a, a newsletter that had been published with a picture of him poking a finger at somebody. And under, underneath it said that he was going to be tough and ruthless. And mm. that, was, that was it for me. Tough, I didn't mind. <laughs> ruthless, without ruthless. mercy. Yeah. <laughs> you know where where does that's not you know compassion is is a significant aspect of life but you use the word fervent and i think that really homes in on it you've you've met my very good friend and colleague Yuval Laor who has been spent the last 25 years developing an analysis of how people become drawn into groups mm. and he's made all sorts of interesting distinctions one of them is that some people are high fervor some people mm. are low fervor. That mm. doesn't mean that they won't stick to the thing. It just means they won't make as much noise about it. People have mm. an experience of awe or wonder. Something happens which is inexplicable mm. to them. It, you know, and, and they then believe that the source of that is to be believed about everything. So, mm. yes, there is that plain contradiction. If, if you say... I remember the first time I met Jerry Armstrong back in 1984 and that three burly ex sea organization people there were going, you're working for the CIA. And they, you could see <laughs> they meant him harm. And there's Jerry sitting there, not noticing anything of it and just having a discussion. He said, show me a clear, show me anybody that's achieved. And of course, I got into the deep history of this. Hubbard claims to have, I think, 270 cases. By the time he writes Dianetics, he says he's cleared 270 people. Now, <laughs> what happened to those people? Not one of them has ever come forward. Mm. What we do know is that among those people, the people he'd treated, many of them complained about what had happened. So Dr. Joseph Winter, who'd worked with him on mm. the book, mm. when Art Sepos, who published the book for the medical publisher Hermitage House, decided it was a fraud, which was, it was published Ooh, by, no. by the October. The publisher said, I'm withdrawing it. It's a fraud. And mm. he commissions Dr. Joe Winter to write a book that says, There's, there might be some value in Dianetics, but Hubbard is a con man. Mm. And 
yeah, I interviewed uh, by by mail. I interviewed Don Rogers, who wrote the appendix to the original Dianetics, which stayed in the book to, until the nineteen eighties. And Don was on the board of every foundation until nineteen fifty four, and there were several of them. And he still really liked Hubbard. You know, thirty years later, he's writing me. He's got nothing against Hubbard at all. Um, but he did point one thing out, which seemed mind boggling to me. He said, when Art Seppos came along and said, "Oh," okay, I'll commission you to write this book. Hubbard turned to me and he said, you know, deep trance hypnosis isn't very popular. We're going to have to find another method. Mm. There was mm. no research. Mm. He went from having hypnotized people and there are letters where he talks about this. Yes. You know, there's the famous 1949 letter to his agent, mm. Forry Ackerman, which Tony yeah. has published. I've had all these letters for years. I didn't realize how desperately people needed to get them. I've got a huge collection of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. In this letter to Fari Ackerman, written from Savannah, Georgia, Hubbard mm -hmm. says he's found a way of raping women mm -hmm. and they will not know that they've been raped. He doesn't talk about helping anybody. Mm -hmm. And then he decides he'll use the reverie or light trans method um, and you get Dianetics. No research, no 270 clears, no anything. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when I talked with Mike Rinder the other week, he was, you know, the introspection rundown was researched on Bruce Welsh. That's mm -hmm. the, I'm going, but medical research is a thousand cases, the gold mm -hmm. standard. One Clinical case. trials. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, <laughs> good points. Excellent points. Mike Rinder and I go back 40, 45 years. And I was right there when he talked about I was telling Jeffrey, I'm going to dream about that stoning of the ship. I was right there, uh, as Mike explained. And I'd like to just add to this That's great true. podcast you did with Mike Rinder. He's a dear, dear close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He's the first person I call on. <laughs> Mike, it's me. <laughs> um, he, he actually played a big part in transitioning me out of out of it all, you know, he was talking to me back channels. And I had an OSA intelligence guy show up at my door and said, Karen, you're talking to Mike Rinder. This is irrevocable. Mm. If you don't immediately cease, you will be declared suppressive person. And I barked at him. How do you know? Are you stealing phone records? How do you know? Mike Rinder is in Florida, the other end. Of, how do you know? And he was evasive and he said, we, we have PIs. And they knew that privately I was talking to Mike Rinder towards the last few weeks of me being in the cult. They knew it because they do buy phone records. Now, of course, we talk on WhatsApp and other modalities. There's no phone record. <laughs> you talk on, there's many ways to talk without any phone record, which is. I want to tell you just a little more. Oh, that smelly men's dorm reminded me. I was considered elite as a class 12. So I was in a woman's dorm of only eight, that was, instead of being with 22 smelly bodies, I was only with eight, because I was a class 12, eight, six, six eight. people, he said there was many yes. 60 people. In Just there. a slither of a bunk bed, that was your space. Yeah. And you know, when you ran down different stairways, sometimes odor would waft upward. And if you went anywhere near the men's dorm, the smell and the stink, and this sort of registered as, how can this be? How can this be the flagship Apollo? The ideal with, theme. Yeah. And it crawled with roaches. Mike didn't get into that. They, you would have something called roach derby. Yeah. And the roach derby meant everybody was commandeered to go find a roach. If you found a roach's nest of eggs, you got $1. But if you found only one roach, you got 50 cents. You literally could cash out. They were so desperate because every time supplies came aboard, the fruit, the vegetables, 
more roaches would come in from these Mediterranean. So we lived with roaches. Not only did we live with smells, we lived with roaches. I'm just telling you what the Apollo, Hubbard of course had cleaners that sanitized his quarters morning, noon and night, his messenger. So he lived in a ivory palace within the Apollo, but Tom, Dick and Harry. <laughs> so Bruce Welch. He actually, this is the young Mike Rinder. It was almost, as he explained, he was still a teenager. 18. This was one of his first assignments. He had to stand outside Bruce Welch's cabin while Bruce screamed. He, he could practically rattle the nearby cabins with his roar of insanity. And Mike had to bodyguard outside eight hours a day listening to a madman from midnight to 8 a.m the young mike runder at 18 years old doing this hubbard decided to be a pen pal and although no one could talk to bruce welch they would exchange little private notes and letters and this became a huge case history which we had to study every morning. At eight o'clock, there was muster. Jeff Walker was the, did the roll call. And then we had to study how Hubbard changed a lunatic into a sane man. And it started off with these little pen, Bruce would write back and then Hubbard would write back to Bruce and then Hubbard, and this was all shoved down, no, no personal contact shoved under the door. And Hubbard's first question was, just before you decided to kill me, what happened in your mind? <laughs> so Bruce Welch was the case history that then started L11, which basically L11's key question is, what evil purpose do you have? This, this is all a migration of, but I will tell you, John, when you're on the high seas, having someone with an intent to kill is scary because you can't throw them in the ocean if you have any humanitarian kindness in your heart. So you're, you're on a confined space with a killer roaming around. I think he grabbed a machete from the galley Mike didn't mention that before he was, they locked him down in this cabin, but he was completely, he wasn't just a silent madman. He was a roaring, want to kill madman. <laughs> and we studied, we were electrified every morning to study what Hubbard and Bruce Welch, it was like a, talk about an ongoing this was an electrifying real life psycho TV show mm -hmm. right on the Apollo. Yeah. And Mike Rinder <laughs> was right there bodyguarding Bruce and listening to his roaring screams eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. And we studied every inch of it. Now, when you're on the high seas, I can understand incarceration and lockdown was needed. But to make this a, a selling rundown, when you're grounded on the base, what is the need for lockdown? You're not on a ship, you're not on the high seas. There's no dangerous killer roaming around. So they transported what was done in one emergency situation on a ship and then made this a repeated rundown till the Lisa McPherson debacle. I mean, even to this day, did you know, did Jeffrey tell you there are four contracts you have to sign before getting any service in the seal? There are four contracts. It now becomes like two inches thick of papers you have to sign in there before they'll even audit you. And one of them is you give them permission 
to do the introspection right now. You give them complete and utter that if you have a mental breakdown, you're going to do what they say. You're going to. I don't have all the wording, but I know you're going to be interviewing Jeff again. You got. You need to explore these four contracts. They get off the hook because you sign that your mental health will be completely, utterly in their ability to rule the waves. Anyway, it, <laughs> that was a very good interview. Thank you for getting, getting Mike Grinder to really tell you. And you see Bruce Welch, he took a little bits and pieces and made it L11. Mm -hmm. So all these people that rushed to L11, this came from handling a magnet. <laughs> L11's roots and ancestor is simply the Bruce Welch coupled together. What have you done? What have you withheld? What evil purpose? This is this is L11. It's the story of a madman culled, and you now pay something like twenty thousand dollars. But you're not the madman, and you don't have an urge to kill L1 Hubbard. But that's L11. And as, as far as we know, Bruce Welsh was offloaded as fast as possible, and we have no idea about his mental health. My presumption, having had to deal with people who have had psychotic episodes as a consequence, particularly of OT3, um, I was called in by the um, mental health asylum that is closest to St. Hill in, in Sussex. And I was astonished, this was many years ago, in the early 1990s, I was astonished. 14 people turned up to him. He talked. Now, I know these people work crazy mm -hmm. hours, very long hours. Why on earth would 14 of them care enough, doctors, nurses, mm -hmm. to try and understand what was happening? Well, it was because every year they had two or three people coming from St. Hill who had mm -hmm. gone completely crazy. They just had a guy who had basically ripped his clothes off, tried to attack everybody, smeared his excrement all over the walls, and they just had to leave him there. And these people, you know, these terrible psychs, these awful, evil people who are trying to destroy L. Ron Hubbard and the universe and all life, they really wanted to know how they could help these people, what they could do. And, it, you know, so one of the things that I learned from them, because there were a number of times when you know, people were sent to me by psychiatrists because they didn't know what to do with them. But one of the things I learned from them is that psychosis is cyclical. Yes. It isn't, you're always in yes, the mm -hmm. So what happened to Bruce Welsh was that the episode went, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that it will have come back. And it may yes. not have been Hubbard he wanted to kill then, it may have been someone else. It may not have been Hubbard in the first place. And what mm -hmm. we see with Hubbard, um, there's a guy called Alfie Hart, He's mentioned uh, still, I think, in uh, Scientology 8.80. Hmm. I think it's, those are the numbers. And it, there, there's a, an acknowledgement to him at the beginning of the book. Or there certainly used to be. Alfie Hart was the editor to Hubbard's books in 1954. He left and he started a, a, a network. You know, I'm not the original gangster. I'm not the godfather. This was happening 30 years before I left. You know, it goes right the way back. Hart left and he started a magazine called The Aberree, which is all mm -hmm. online. You can find it. It's hilariously funny. Almost everybody who was significant in the tens of movements that came out of Scientology and Dianetics, people like A.E. Van Vogt, for example, the great science fiction writer, who gave up writing and for the rest of his life, the next 30 something years, practiced Dianetics. Thought Scientology was complete nonsense. So I corresponded with him. But he and um, Don Purcell, who owned all the rights to Dianetics because uh, he saved Hubbard from bankruptcy, these people would all contribute. So you have this ongoing history. But there's an article in one of them where Alfie Hart says Hubbard should actually every six months when he discovers the secret of the universe, he should say, this is it, but put the date on it. So this is it, April 1957, this is it. And Bruce Welsh is yet another of these examples of, you know, he says in technical degrades, that dreadful mm -hmm. policy letter, everything I've said is true. You can't change any of it. It doesn't matter whether it was the most recent or an older statement, whatever I say, that's the tech. 
And of course, you start going, but there are complete contradictions here. You know, even in simple things, um, you, you never call a, a floating needle if it's outside the two to three point five range on the tone arm. And there's another bulletin that says some idiot has said, yeah, it was you, Ron. You, you're the idiot who said you don't do this. And that's the case so often that you become locked. You can't think. You've got contradictory information. Mm -hmm. So coming from Hubbard, and you can't really think with it, tend to do, do what you're told. Behind that is his inability to ever be wrong. Mm -hmm. Is you know, so that he's completely changed his mind about something. But because he researched you know, LSD years after they've come off LSD, um, on research into two cases, I have found one of those two cases was uh, Harvey Haber. And mm -hmm. Harvey told me about this. And he said, what happened was I annoyed Hubbard and this woman had annoyed Hubbard. And so he had our folders gone through. And you know what a folder error summary can be like tens and tens <laughs> of hours of work. And the only thing in common was that we'd both taken LSD. That was the research that said oh that goodness. all people who've taken LSD are stupid, yeah. you know, psychotic, can't be. Then you find out that Hubbard himself took LSD. Oh. You know, he told David Mayo this out of session. He said, oh, I took wow. that. You know, I got a letter from a guy whose guru had taken LSD with Hubbard in the 50s, you know, and that everything you're into this you know, originally one of the titles for Blue Sky was uh, Hubbard Through the Looking Glass, mm. because it seemed to me that everything is the opposite of what it appears to be. Scientology claims to be a religion. It's actually an intelligence agency. <laughs> you know, it claims to be liberating mankind from implants. It's actually implanting people with behaviors and ideas and making them more fervent, making them more fanatical to the point the case you you mentioned I, I i'm not gonna mention the guy's name and i you know i don't know if he's still alive but uh, i was giving a talk and this guy arrived and he was in a wheelchair and he his flesh kind of overlapped the wheelchair he was a very he, he was morbidly obese mm. and he started talking about being in the sea org aboard the ship mm. and he said that i'd I'd got everything about Hubbard and Scientology right, except the tech works. That's the bit I'd got wrong. Mm. And uh, I looked at him. And he could barely move. His wife had brought him along. She wasn't in Scientology because some of his old friends were, were going to be talking. Mm. And she thought it might cheer him up because he was horribly depressed. Mm. He then told me that one of our mutual friends, uh, Otto Rose, Mm -hmm. uh, who I knew very well in the 1990s um, and, and was very helpful, gave me a tremendous amount of information, um, very thorough, very precise. Um, but it, he started to lose his sight. And this guy was saying that he was devising a process that would give Otto his sight back. Mm -hmm. He kind of going, exactly, I said to him exactly what you said, look in the mirror. It doesn't work. You know, th there is no Scientologist has passed the level of communication release, which is a very low level. They can't communicate freely with anyone on any subject because they can't talk about their case. They can't use verbal tech. They can't describe Scientology and they can't talk to this huge list of people that they're forbidden <laughs> free to communicate with anyone on any subject. Then you get to clear an, an operating Thetan. If there was a single operating Thetan, they wouldn't have needed the Guardian's office. They could have seen what was in those files. They wouldn't need to fight somebody like you or me. Yeah. They could just silence us using their superpowers. It's not true. It doesn't work. And yet, as you say, it will be, yeah, but haven't you had wins? Yeah. It's like... Yeah, you know, I felt happy going to the fair. I felt happy in the cinema. You know, these are not, it's not because of the process of cinema and I now have to worship cinema that I thought that, you know, Apocalypse Now was a good film. It, yeah. it, it kind of makes this thing dependent upon the guru, the god figure, the, um, the bringer of wisdom. And in Hubbard's case, 
um, you're dealing with an incredibly tortured soul. You're dealing with a very unhappy man who was ill pretty much all of the time. You know, he talked about terror stomach in the 50s and his ulcers, which was his actual war wound. We didn't find anything else in looking through the records. So he did say he fell down a ship's ladder at one point. He even admits this. There's a, I think it's 23rd September 1950, Introduction to Dianetics, a lecture which David Miscavige has now issued, where he tells the truth about failing his course in atomic and molecular physics. And yet yeah. later on, he becomes a nuclear physicist. Yeah. He tells the truth about having something wrong with his feet. And that was about the limit of his war wounds. But he had ulcers. He was an alcoholic. Um, we now are in the situation where there are some people who were with him who really want to believe. And you can only start thinking, do they have Stockholm syndrome? Mm. Did they really not see him screaming his head off at people, giving them severe reality adjustments? Mm. Because I've interviewed quite a lot of people. Did they really think that overboarding would not be traumatic this man who'd come to cure trauma is throwing people overboard putting For a minor minor error not some hideous crunch but throwing overboard anyway yeah I think, yeah punishing yeah. people hurting people to to release them from engrams <laughs> and putting a child in the chain locker that was the one that stopped me the, the viciousness of Scientology is something hard to swallow because it's an entity of vengeance. Vengeance. Every SP clan cutting you off from everybody else and the punishments they give, it's retaliation and vengeance. A religion, John, I know you'll agree with me, should have kindness, compassion, love, harmony. Uh, engagement in the oneness of our higher selves. The but it should bring out the. You should become a better human being because you belong to this entity. Then the religion has done its job. You are a better human being because I'm a da da da. In Scientology, the vengeance and hate. I was in 40 years, 40 years. And I never ever thought of speaking out, ever. Mm -hmm. I vented a little under an anonymous name called War and Peace. I vented some, but I was going to go my, I lead a very full life. I do animal rescue, which is a huge part of my life. Uh, and I'm plugged into all, I, I, I have lives, with my art dealing totally outside the cult. I need a full life. I didn't need to be this, but they immediately in vengeance, because I was talking to Mike Rinder and Marty Rathburn, cut me off from my one child, Alexander Chench. And they shipped him off to Dallas, Fort Worth, so he would be far away from me and they completely cut the line saying, she's a suppressive person. But before he left for Dallas, they got my son to call me. And he said, mom, mom, I want you to go to this page. It was a hate page that the cult had set up on me. They got my son to visit a hate page and call me up and say, can you, can you look at the... John, I had a boob job. I felt dowdy when I came out of the Sea Org. I had a little bit of, who cares? Who cares about somebody? It's, it's a boyfriend, girlfriend thing. I had a boob job. The only people that knew was my auditor, because at the time I was a true believer and you have anesthesia for surgery. So I ran Dianetics. So only the cult knew. It's not something you broadcast for. Who needs to know about somebody else's boob job? So they did a hate page. Ha, 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 Karen de la Carriera had a boob job, blah, blah, blah. And they got my son to take me to this hate page and say, mom, you had a boob job? They got my son to say this on the phone to me. Then they, 
bundled him off to Dallas Fort Worth. Long story short, he died at 27 years old. He had no mom because he had been told he had been completely, he grew up in the cult and nobody talks to an SP. And I was the suppressive person. And his father, Heber Jench, president of Church of Scientology International, was in lockdown for eight years in that hell called SP hole, suppressive person hole. So he had no dad, no mom, he was orphaned. And when he got pneumonia, walking pneumonia, he took no antibiotics. John, a $20 antibiotic would have saved his life. $20. He had no, he, he was taking, he had chest pains, which your lungs can give you with walking pneumonia. And he kept taking drugs. And he even took methadone. Or anyway, he was dead. So I feel the cult of Scientology have blood on their hands. Oh, the reason that Alexander Gench died at 27, can you imagine the loss? You've got two, two beautiful boys. I mean, just three, 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 because Sam was four. Can you imagine the loss of your son? This is what the cult did. I call it a death cult. So busy were they having vengeance. She's speaking out, we're going to take away her son. And then they, they would rather he die than I'm known to be affluent. I'm a pretty affluent person. I would have had a full medical done on him. He would have been on the right antibiotic within an hour. But they chose out of the vengeance which came from Hubbard and rolled down because Hubbard was very much into retaliation. Every SB declare is a vengeance on you. You can walk in and out of the Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic church. They don't put out an issue on you saying you're an anti-social personality and you will never talk to your son again. That's the cult of Scientology. And after Alexander died, I started my YouTube channel and I have 11.5 million views in seven years, which means more than 1 million people a year listen to my voice on YouTube. They don't look when they're stupid and foolish and fling out a hate vendetta. They don't dream for a moment of what the consequences can be. They're trying to appease and placate David Miscavige. So they think in the moment, and by God, I come back. I come back and expose. <laughs> I didn't dream how successful I would ever be. So John, my respect for someone like you is beyond what I can say. Because you're on the road to truth and it's in your DNA to expose lies. I, 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 I've been, when I listen to you, when I follow, when I, I see your urge to just unveil and uncover falsehoods, fakeness, the prison of belief because of swallowing the hogwash. And therefore, I salute you. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. And, and it is that Hubbard in, um, in 1968, a, a, a journalist called Charlie Nairn, who'd already made one film about Scientology, was tasked by Granada TV to go and interview Ron Hubbard. And um, it took him a while to find him, but he got there and he made a documentary, which is the best documentary that will ever be made about Scientology. And I've worked on a few called The Shrinking World of L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, I believe I even, yeah, I've seen it. It is it's on YouTube. It's 20 minutes long. It's yeah. the only hostile interview of Ron Hubbard. And he comes apart. He had a first wife and a third wife. I had no second wife. He, said, no second he named wife. two wives. He, 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 he says, oh, there are no Swiss bank. Oh, there's one Swiss bank account. 
yeah. when asked, um, does he believe in reincarnation? He pauses. So Charlie says, uh, but your followers believe. And he goes, oh, yes, they believe. <laughs> and you, you sort of get the man. But what Charlie said was that for two hours before the camera went on, from about one in the morning, one or two in the morning, he and Hubbard talked. And he said to Hubbard, it's a scam, isn't it? And Hubbard went, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> don't, don't be ridiculous. And he said, Charlie, is, he, just, he was about 25 at the time, lovely guy. And he said, it must be so hard for you having to keep the pretense up all the time. And, and Hubbard was, yeah, poor me. You know, kind of. Good, so Charlie Nairn said to him, why do you do it? And this is where the revenge thing comes in. The first part, he said, it's nice being able to tell your wife you've made $10,000 today. This is 1968. So that's mm -hmm. more like a million dollars. You know, it's certainly hundreds of thousands now every day. That's nice. But he said, the real reason is I like to catch the clever ones and reel them in and for me that's a 10 year old boy saying nobody loves me i'm going to get my own back on you and that's what scientology is it's ron hubbard's revenge on the world you know mm -hmm. i last year i published a chapter with steve hassan uh, no, actually it hasn't been published yet it's coming out in the oxford university press and we looked at elliot roger uh, mm -hmm. the Ela vista killings in santa barbara who was this young man who was an involuntary celibate, an incel, who railed against, because women wouldn't go out with him. And he's saying, look, I'm good looking. I've got money. I've got this fancy new BMW. Why won't? And he's put out these videos and then he went and killed people. He killed six women and three men. And in his departing video, he said that he was going to show women the world over that they shouldn't have rejected him. And that mm -hmm. felt so much like the little boy Hubbard, that, that kind mm -hmm. of immature idea of i'm going to show you all i'm going to teach you all and hubbard kind of did because he left 648 million dollars that he had extracted vampirically from his followers who in return got what the feeling that of euphoria the sense that they were special the belief that they were superior to the rest of humanity what else did they actually get you know, they didn't have any special powers. They couldn't resist disease and illness. They didn't have perfect memory or emotional equanimity or any of the things he'd promised. Yeah. He got his revenge. He, yeah. he showed people what fools they were. And from what I hear about OT8, this kind of explains that the whole thing was, well, now you've got to undo everything that you did. And that, that'll be... <laughs> I got, we got to do a show just on OT8. I have so much data. It would be a Saturday night live special. That means we would get so much laughter. You know, this is all so dark, so hateful. So we can lighten it up. I yeah. gotta do a show on OTA for you. But you know, one thing I do want to tell you is I loved that you connected so well with David Mayo. He was my dearest, dearest hero. I just absolutely, I got comment because of it. I tried to stay David loyal to David Mayo after he was declared. And I got a committee of evidence just saying, she thinks David Mayo is a great man. Um, I, I, oh, my track with David on the ship, uh, what a man of honor. If there's one word, with you I go into the word, if I could label, it's truth. Truth versus lies. With David, I think honor and integrity was most important to him. I, oh, we have so many mutual friends. Ira Chalif was the commanding officer of AOSH UK when I was this young intern at St. Hill. And I've known Ira through Jay Hurwitz. He, he's a friend. He fled in base when those 12 were all sent to the running program. No. He fled. No. He fled with Alan Buchanan and all the others. Matthew. Is Jay alive and well? Is Jay chugging I've along? I've been in touch with Jay for years. You I've haven't, been. didn't answer, but, but uh, you kept me in suspense. Did he testify? Uh, he, he did, yeah. Um, he did! Whoa! The case was won. Um, <laughs> 
but yeah i i mean I, ira i i've stayed in touch with i've yes. known him for 43 yes. years now i think it is and yes. uh, you know he actually worked for me briefly when he was on a leave ah. of seal ah. so ah. the point where he went to the u.s and uh, in what, 82 and was declared suppressive i got yeah. i was called in by peter shantz who you probably also know yes who, I know peter, shantz. peter called me in saint hill and said you know you've got to come in and i'm i wasn't the sort of person who felt compelled to go to events or anything like that so somebody was insisting i do something i didn't necessarily do it but peter was so insistent so i went in and he said um there's a rumor that Ira is going to be declared. What are we going to do about this? And I said, well, of course, we'll fight it. It's a ridiculous idea. The idea that Ira Chaloff is suppressive. Forget it. You know, he's, he's a wonderful guy. And a week later, I got a phone call from Peter Shan saying, I've got to come in again. So I went in and he said, um, he's been declared. And I said, what are we going to do about it? And he said, oh, these people, you know, they can be so devious or something like that. I'm sort of, well, well, where's the declare? What, what's he done? He said, oh, there isn't one. I'm sort of, but so there's no court of ethics, committee of evidence, no bill of particulars. This is, this is illegal. This is off policy. And he's like, no. Said, How do you know he's declared? I've got a list of 600 names. <laughs> 600. Again, that, that's your idea of, of Scientology. My idea of Scientology was you follow the policy that says this has got to happen. And I, you know, that was... That was actually the next six months. I've not really talked about this because Ira was, yeah, you know, because he was working, you know, with congressmen and things like this from the yes. 1980s. It was a bit of a difficult situation. But he has now gone public. I wrote a, a book five years ago, and he he said he contacted one of his friends who he knew would disconnect from him because he said, "Look, I'm supporting John Atac, and you know mm -hmm. he's, you know, so that's the way it will be." But but he has spoken yeah. at he's had an incredible career he is one of the yes. most important yeah. thinkers of our time with courageous followership and intelligent disobedience and you have to say he learned this in the negative he learned <laughs> by being around hubbard you know the only time i've ever seen a severe reality adjustment because i wasn't in the seal was yeah. ira did did it to my wife my first yeah. wife she hadn't sold any paintings that week i'm, I'm an artist that's my real life and she hadn't sold. So he got her in a tiny little room, stood two inches away from her and screamed at her. And I hovered outside the door. I'd never heard anything like this before. And the next time I saw him, about three days later, sat in man and said, what, what was you doing? Where, where's the policy on doing that? And he said, there is no policy. And I said, if it isn't written, it isn't true, because that's what you said. <laughs> and he, he, I said, who told you to do this? And he put his head in his hands and he started crying. He said Hubbard did it to us. And at that you know, it was a major shift. You know, I was still a Scientologist. I'd done OT5 and all of that. I wasn't very happy with Scientology and the way it was going, but I still really believed it was the, the way, the truth, the life. It was the only thing that was going to save mankind. And here I'm being told that the man who created this system is a raving lunatic. You know, for me, anybody that cannot control their temper that's not a buddha figure for me that's not a guru figure for me somebody who feels they have to burn people to the ground with their rage imagine how many people are there out there still are still traumatized i met a guy who'd been 20 years housebound 20 years without leaving the house because hubbard had told him he was a suppressive person and he didn't want to hurt anyone Wow. It took one afternoon to get him out and about again, you know, largely, in fact, because of his wife's incredible endurance and patience. But he mm. sat down, he read, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky and mm. talked with me yeah. for a couple of hours, went back home, got a job and it was over. But the nice. effect that just one conversation with Ron Hubbard had had on him. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, <laughs> nice anecdote. I, my suppressive person declare is a lot of fluff and fluff and froth of nothing. But what was highly amusing is a charge in my SB declare was that I yelled and I screamed 
And I interrelated with this screaming. And I thought to myself, you were not on the ship with Hubbard. You say ice cream? Hubbard would shake the Apollo with his temper tantrum rages, which would even to Mary Sue, his own wife, he was completely out of control with his temper tantrums. Yeah. That, <laughs> to name me as someone who now and again yelled when Hubbard was the poster boy for yelling, screaming, throwing temper tantrums and losing it. And, and it, again, it, it supports this idea that he never grew up. He was a child. He, he never matured. And he had, you know, it, I saw it so many times. What, what happens in Scientology is somebody, they, they do a process, they feel fantastic. They feel really high. They write a success story. They go and borrow some more money. And three days later, and it's usually three days later, they don't feel so good. Yeah. Now they're a potential trouble source. What an interesting phrase that is. Yeah, the label Ron Hubbard. You lost your gains, your PTS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and post traumatic stress, of course, accidentally picked up the same uh, initialization, yeah. PTS, <laughs> um, which is what you will get in Scientology, that's for sure. Then, of course, you have to go and get the next dose to get the yeah. feeling back. And it, it excludes everything else. When I interviewed um, people who, who were doing transcendental meditation, it's about 1991, I was asked to write a book, which I decided not to write. I was shocked when I found out there were people who were meditating 12 hours a day. Their children were running wild. They'd lost their job, but they'd become so obsessed with this feeling that they were getting, this high they were getting, yeah. it had become more important to them than their own yeah. children. Yeah, yeah. Which I that's personally what, cannot understand. That's what we covered earlier. It's it's like a heroin fix or something. They want that high. A human being wants a high, whether it's a million dollar win at a casino or a drug like LSD or whatever. To get that high, they will go through pain, suffering, heart. Look at look at these people, the slaves in the sea world. They just stay on year in and year out with devastated lives because they believe I got that high and I can get it again. Things will change, blah, 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 blah. John, listen, it's been just enchanting having some time. We, we can, I hope you will invite, I've got, uh, I've got things to tell you. I really have got things to tell you, but let's not. I think that when it's a little shorter than too long, we get more audience. I've learned this very well with my channel. And we've talked a while. It's been just really great to hang with you. John, talk to me soon, huh? Yeah, uh, well, let's do this again. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so it's much. Really, really, it was fun. It was fun. Bye bye. Bye, bye John. Thanks a lot. Love to you and a big hug. So, uh, what do you call it? Virtual hug. Virtual, Virtual hug. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Bye. a lot. I've been John Atak, my guest Karen de la Carrier. Thank you. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.